Stand up for the uh, reading of the word. Title tonight is Power Encounter, Exodus 7. We talk about these power encounters that you see in the scriptures, and they are, they are power encounters that we should be having on, a, you know, on our walk with the Lord. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you in Exodus chapter 7. I'm going to read verse 8 through 13. El Señor les dijo de Moises. The, the Latino, the, was that good? Yes. It actually sounded good, right? Yeah. You just don't want me to read anymore. <laughs> so I'm just, it's like when Michael Bloomberg was speaking in Spanish, the, go, you know, the mayor of New York. It was, uh, it, was, it was like a Saturday night comedy special. Okay, the word of the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, when Pharaoh speaks to you saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went in to Pharaoh and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Pharaoh's heart grew hard and did not heed them, as the Lord had said. And Father, we, we go through the scriptures, Lord God. Let us realize that these encounters that we see in scripture, Lord God, that they are encounters that we may be dealing with on a daily basis. Give us the discernment to be able to, Lord God, see what is going on in the spiritual realm around us. And Lord God, give us the boldness, the faith, the armor of God, Lord God, to overcome the evil one, to operate in your authority and power, Lord God, to set the captives free and establish your kingdom. Father, I pray that this message tonight would have a transforming effect, Lord God, upon all here. Father, when I first began to study these things, it did on me. And I would say that, Lord God, tonight and pray that it would have the same on them. Bless us tonight. Be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. So you see here again, this is a, a power encounter. What is a power encounter? It is a battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. It is an encounter uh, with the kingdom of light coming in conflict with the kingdom of darkness. It is a, a conflict between the kingdom of hell and the, uh, the kingdom of heaven. And um, what's interesting, these encounters... When you go through the scriptures, you see that God frequently chooses angels to fight these battles. And there are times when he chooses his children, his servants, to fight these battles. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just take you through here very quickly. The mission, uh, again, is reiterated. We didn't, we didn't cover verses 1 through 7. But I just want to show you again. God sends Moses and Aaron into this battle into this conflict. We're going to be looking at the conflict because it goes on and you have the ten plagues that will continue through these next weeks. So if you look back at Exodus chapter 7, 1 through 7, so the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet, and you shall speak all that I command you. Okay, so go and speak the word. And Aaron your brother shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land, and uh, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders. So here he is, they're being told to speak the word and that God's power is going to go with them. But Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may uh, lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and uh, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt to great uh, judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded them. So they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. So I just want you to notice in the, in the red, just again, speak. God is saying here, go and speak what I tell you. And we are to be speaking the word of God. We are going to be speaking the oracles of God and proclaiming God. Notice that again, he will, they will be accompanied by God's power, signs and wonders. And then here, the purpose of this is that the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. 
And that is the purpose of bringing people into a knowledge and awareness of God. And then again, the, the, verse 6, and then Moses and Aaron did as the Lord had in, you know, commanded them. So they go out on this mission. And I just want to stress this. I think a lot of people, they're not experiencing the power of God and the supernatural because they're not stepping out. And I just think that there's something, when we step out in faith, when we get out, right, we step out of our comfort zone. Even let me just say something, this is a comfort zone for me. Though to what I'll tell you this, when I preach things that ruffle your feathers, when I preach things that convict you, that's where I'm stepping out of my comfort zone. And, and I've done that throughout the ministry here. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not here to itch people's ears. I'm, I'm not here to, you know, I'm not here for you to like me. You know, it's nice if you like me, but I'm here to preach the gospel to you. And that is the main purpose. And you know, you, you see people get offended and they leave. You know, people come around here, they, they, they you know, at times they, they, they love you, you know, for a little while until they hear what they don't like to hear and then they, they run out. But again, that's, that's, that's okay. Because I'm, I'm going to preach the gospel and I'm going to preach it as, as clearly as, you know, as I can and with the power and authority that God has given me to preach it. Um, but when we step out of our comfort zone, and a lot of the times me stepping out of my comfort zone, again, is not, is not here in the church. It's out there. But when you step out of your comfort zone, I think that's where you really step into the supernatural of God. And what you're going to experience is, that's where you're going to experience the attacks and the oppression. So, you see this power encounter here, and again, in, in Exodus chapter 7, and Aaron and Moses go into the very court of Pharaoh, and Aaron throws down, right, the staff. The staff turns into a snake, and then the Egyptians basically do the same thing, uh, and then Aaron's staff eats the snakes, or the staffs of the Egyptians. Now, I just want to, I want to ask you this question, was what the Egyptian magicians did, was it just, was it magic? When I say magic, I'm not talking about anything supernatural. A magician. You ever see a good magician? You would swear he's making things disappear. You get a good music, a magician, I mean, it's amazing what, you know, what they can do with illusion. But was it just magic or was there something supernatural happening here? What do you think? Yeah, I lean towards the idea that, that this, was, this was the works of the devil. That's right. And that the devil can do certain miracles. And I, I think that, I believe that's, you know, that's what happened. So I want to I show you, I'm just going to show you a quick, uh, if we can get sound. This is from the Ten Commandments. Do we have sound? The Most High. These must be ambassadors to an Indian uh, Bedouins. Make it a little louder. What gifts do you bring? We bring you the word of God. What is this word? Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. Let my people go. The slaves are mine. Their lives are mine. All that they own is mine. I do not know your God, nor will I let Israel go. Who are you to make their lives bitter in hard bondage? Man shall be ruled by law, not by the will of other men. <laughs> Who is this God that I should let your people go? Aaron, cast down my staff before Pharaoh he may see the power of God. In this you shall know that the Lord is God. Mother! Mother! He turned his staff into a cobra! Nothing of his will harm you, my son. The power of your God is a cheap magician's trick. Janus. See, 
because this serpent swallows up the others. Have you ever seen the Ten Commandments? You, gave you can watch it on YouTube. Moses, Moses, Moses! <laughs> snakes can eat snakes, okay? And that's what uh, Moses' rod, Moses, you know, Aaron's rod, the snake ate the snake. Now, I'll show you something neat, and then I want to get into this, again, concept of power encounters. In 2 Timothy 3.8, you get a little commentary on what's going on in the courtroom of uh, Pharaoh. It says, now, as James and Jambres... And James and Jambres, it was believed, were the magicians in Pharaoh's court. Uh, as they resisted Moses, so did uh, these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds uh, disapproving concerning the faith. But they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as, uh, as, their, as theirs uh, also was. Now, James, James and Jambres in the Talmud, you know when we talk about the Talmud, it's a commentary on the Old Testament. In the Talmud in the Mishnah, it, it tells us James and Jambres were the magicians who were there in the court. When the Israelites left Egypt, the Talmud says that James and Jambres went with the Israelites. And then what they did was, maybe they went with them not for the purpose of actually being converted, they then worked under the scenes and they were part of the conspiracy of, Bill, of making the molten calf when Moses was up on Sinai. And then the Talmud also says that they partnered with Balaam. You know the story of Balaam and Balak? That they were assistants to Balaam, who attempted to put curses on Israel, and it ended up coming back on the, on the Midianites. But um, that's, what, you know, that's what, again, the, the tradition of the Talmud and the Mishnah uh, tell us, whether that's, again, true or not. Apparently, they again, these are the names of the, 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 the conspirators, the the. Uh, magicians and the sorcerers who were there in the court uh, in, with this encounter. So I want to, I wanna, again, I want to get into power encounters with you, and I want to cover a, a number of encounters that you see in the Scripture. Again, it, it is a conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. It's a conflict between kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness, between the kingdom of righteousness and the kingdom of sin, and God will use warrior angels in these conflicts, and he will also use his children. He will use his servants. So I want to, I want to show you a couple of supernatural, angelic encounters. The first, Michael the archangel versus the devil. Now where do we see that? Book of Jude. Yeah, the book of Jude. Okay, and it's verse 9 in the book of Jude. It tells us this. Yet Michael the archangel... In contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Now, you know, what is this? I, I believe what it is, when Moses died, Moses is buried on Mount Nebo. I believe that the devil was trying to get his body. And, and for what purpose? Uh, imagine if the devil got his body. Now, the, the Israelites are, wor are, again, are worshiping a molten calf. They, they worship Baal, they worship Ashtoreth, they worship Molech, they worship Chemosh, they worship all these false gods, all these false deities. Could you imagine if they got the body, if, if, if the body of Moses was then presented, they would have been worshiping the body of Moses. And, and if you think that's strange, how many of you have ever gone to Rome? You go to Rome and you go to St. Peter's, there's a statue of Peter. He doesn't have a right toe. You know why he doesn't have a right toe? It's been kissed off. The people kiss it. And over the centuries and hundreds and hundreds of years, they basically just deteriorated the toe of Peter. And it just, you know, if you've come from the Roman Catholic background, you know the worship. The worship of saints and the worship of Mary. And uh, I think that the humans are, you know, we, we are worshipers by nature. We'll worship anything. You get into Hinduism, they'll worship a tree or a rock. So I think the battle is going on here that the devil wants to take this and use it as an idol, the body of Moses. So there's a battle going on and Michael is sent and Michael battles Satan. And you'll notice this, and Judah's making this point, he does not bring a reviling accusation against him but says, the Lord rebuke you. You know, just that, that is a key component to understanding spiritual warfare. 
We have no power to come against the devil. But in the Lord's name, if, you ever feel, if you're ever feeling harassed by the enemy, and let me just stress this, a lot of times I see people in the church and they're going through depression and they're getting, they have anxiety. And do you realize a lot of these things could be coming from the enemy? He, he's the author of oppression. He's the, he, he wants to bring depression. He wants to discourage you. And just to rebuke him in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. You're coming under attack in your family. Maybe your marriage, your marriage comes under attack. Rebuke him in the name of the Lord. And speak it. Speak it out. Another battle, Michael's army versus Satan and his army. And this occurs in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Now we know, the scripture tells us actually in Revelation chapter 12, that when Satan originally rebelled, he took a third of the angels with him. Okay, they are the principalities, the powers, the authorities, and the rulers that are spoken about in Ephesians chapter 6. But there is a future battle between Michael and Satan. Now watch this, this passage. A war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. Now understand this? Satan still has access to heaven? Look at the book of Job. Who's, who's in the court of God? Hey, Satan, where you been? I've been roaming through the earth. Roaming back and forth through the earth. So he still has access. Angels, you look at scripture. Angels, the book of Micah. Angels, fallen angels still have access to the throne of God. Now people say, well, that, does that mean when I die there's going to be demons? No. That, does that mean when I die there's going to be... The throne room of God. Okay. The demons, the angels, fallen angels have access there. Now, in verse 9... So the great dragon was cast out and the serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now when you understand what's going on in the book of the Revelation chapter 6 through 19 and all hell is breaking loose on the earth. That's because now Satan and his rulers and principalities have now come to the earth and they're just, they're just you know, wreaking havoc upon the earth during the seven year tribulation period. Okay, another glimpse at, at an angelic battle. Michael versus the prince of Persia. And you go to the book of Daniel and you see Daniel praying. And Daniel, is, he, he's grieved and he's crying out to God. And so an angel comes to him. And then you have this in verse 12. Then he said to me, do not fear Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. You ever wonder sometimes when you're praying and there's a delay? Watch this. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now, notice the, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. It's not talking about a human prince. Because a human prince is not going to be able to withstand an angel. So it's talking about, uh, apparently, uh, again, a principality, a power, a fallen angel who has dominion of Persia. And you, you, get, a, you get an insight into some things that are going on here you know, in, in, in our world. So it says this, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief uh, princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So there's a spiritual battle going on. Michael is sent to apparently liberate this angel who is in this turmoil with, with, you know, with the king of, or the prince of Persia. So then he is able to come to Daniel and give him the answer that he was seeking. 21 days delay. When we're praying many times, there, there are things going on in the spiritual realm around us. You may be praying for the salvation of people. You may be praying for the healing of people. You may be praying for things that are going nationally, globally. And your prayers are being heard. And those prayers are, are causing something, uh, an empowerment to go on in that, you know, in, that, in that spiritual realm, in that supernatural realm. Now you look at this. This is apparently the demon, okay, this fallen angel had some type of dominion over Persia. Look at Persia today. What is Persia? It's Iran. 
I wonder if he's still there. Look at our country. Where, where do you, what are the areas, the cities in our nation, where you see that the devil has a, a stronghold? Strongholds, dominion. You could look at Chicago, right? With all the, the killings and the shootings. L.A.? New York? Yeah, Miami? New Orleans? You know, and by the way, this doesn't mean that everybody in the city is going to hell. And even obviously, you go to New York, there's many believers. There's many, many people who know the Lord there. But you look that there are certain areas where the devil has a stronghold. Las Vegas, San Francisco. Those are strongholds of the enemy. And I can guarantee that there, there is some very powerful principal, uh, principality or ruler, right, authority that's in those places. Now, I want to take you down. Let's come down to earth. So you start going through the scriptures. What's the story, the story of David and Goliath? Facing, you know, facing the giant. If you know who Goliath is, who were Goliath's descendants? Nephilim. He's Nephilim, right? These are, now, these are now generations that have passed, and he's probably not, he's not a full-fledged Nephilim, but you have the, the Redifim, the Anakim, you start, to, you start to move on, but he is, he is a descendant of Nephilim. And you see in the battle in 1 Samuel chapter 17, 45 through 47, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And you know the rest of the story. One stone smack in the, you know, the forehead, drops him and then he goes and cuts his head off. But that's again, that, this is a spiritual conflict. Another, another spiritual conflict, 1 Kings 18, Elijah versus the prophets of Baal. So the prophets of Baal have taken over under Ahab and Jezebel. And they're worshiping. But by the way, Baal is another name for who? Satan. It's basically, it's, it's, it's pretty much pure Satan worship. And so Elijah challenges them to this contest. You make an altar, I'll make an altar. You make an altar of rocks, you, I'm going to make an altar of rocks. We're going to put wood around it. I'm going to put wood around it. And they go through this whole thing. And the prophets of Baal, they, you know, they go and they dance around it. They start beating themselves like the Philippine, Filipinos when they start striking themselves during a holy week. And they're bleeding and the blood's flowing. And then Elijah, after a few hours, starts mocking them. And he mocks them. He says, where's your God? Is your God asleep? Where's your God? Is your God having dinner? You know what he says? Where's your God? Is he on the pooper? That's, that's what he says. And we, 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 get, we change the translation. So here's, here's um, 1 Kings chapter 18. Again, you see this conflict. And it came to pass at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done all these things uh, at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord and that you have turned their hearts back to you. Again, I want you to notice that because the, the purpose of a power conflict is that, again, people would know the Lord. And then the fire from the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. By the way, uh, Elijah, he poured water all around it just so that everybody would know it wasn't a trick. And the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the... It burned up everything, not just the wood, but the rocks. Now, uh, now, then when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. That's the purpose of a power conflict. And then Elijah, they did away with the prophets of Baal. You come to the New Testament, and you see Jesus in a number of power conflicts with Satan. So you look at the temptation, and I'll just, I'm just going to touch on the first temptation here in Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 4. It said, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. And notice this. Where's the Spirit leading him? He's leading him into the conflict. I mean, Jesus is, is in tune with the Spirit. He's in touch with the Spirit. He's Spirit-led. He's baptized in the Spirit. So the Spirit leads him right into the conflict. 
Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness uh, to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. But he answered and said, Now watch, what does he combat the devil with? With the Word of God. He uses the word to defeat the enemy. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. In the preceding next uh, two temptations, same thing. In fact, the devil's quoting scripture to him. And Jesus refutes the enemy using the word of God. So you see these power conflicts with the enemy continuously throughout the Gospels with Jesus' ministry. Another one, and this is a big one, Jesus versus Legion. Right, there's this man who's possessed with a, a legion of demons, 4,000, 5,000 demons. He's out of his mind. He runs around naked. They chain him. He breaks his chains. He lives up in the tombs. He's howling and screaming. The people are terrified of him. So it, it tells us that in Mark chapter uh, 5, verses 6 through 13, by the way, they cross the Galilee in the boat. What happened to them when they were crossing the Galilee? Storm. storm. You know what I believe? Jesus rebukes the storm. It's kind of an odd thing, rebuking a storm. Like he rebuked it. He spoke to it like he did demons. He rebuked demons. And, and he rebukes the storm. You know what I believe that storm was? It was a storm that was caused by the enemy. Because the enemy knew where he was going. And I think the enemy had an inclination about what he was about to do in delivering this man who was filled with these demons. So what does the enemy do? He changes the weather. He blows in a little storm from the Mediterranean Sea. It comes over the Nazarene Hills and it causes this great squall in the Sea of Galilee. Look at the book of Job. Satan can cause storms. You ever see a tornado? I mean, if there's anything I've ever seen on this earth that looks like something that came out of hell, it's a tornado. So, so in Mark chapter 5, 6 through 13, when Jesus, when he saw Jesus, the demon, demoniac, from afar, he ran and worshipped him. This is a weird thing. He ran and worshipped What it's saying is he fell on his face before him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he uh, answered and saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now, a large herd of swine were feeding there near the mountains, so all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And apparently these demons, what do they want? They want to be in flesh. I'll tell you, I have a theory. I have a theory that, that demons are not fallen angels. I believe that demons are the spirits of the Nephilim who died on this earth, who were roaming the earth. And I believe that angels are the principalities, powers that are ruling more in the heavenly realm. Now they're directing everything and they're... Yeah, that's, that is a, a theological position that a lot of theologians have. It's not, it's not uncommon. It's mostly, I'd say today in evangelical churches, one, I mean many of you are hearing this for the first time, right? I just, I, I don't see angels who are created with this incredible glory wanting to hang out in a pig, 4,000 of them. But the Nephilim spirits, I believe, I can see that. So it's just a, a thing. I'll find out when I get to heaven if that's, if, if that's correct or not. But I do believe that that could very well be the case. So here, so verse 11. Now uh, a large herd of uh, swine were feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. And there were about 2,000. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So there again is a conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. You go to the book of Acts and you see a number of conflicts that occur in the ministry of Peter and Paul. Now, now one of them is when Paul, he's in conflict with this woman who has a spirit of divination. In fact, if you remember, this is going back maybe a, a year or so ago, I, I taught on this. I taught on this for about three weeks, talking about the spirit of divination and what this woman was involved in. She was basically involved in a cult that worshipped uh, Apollo, you know, the god Apollo. And uh, it's interesting. I believe that behind the god Apollo is a demon. And if you come to Revelation chapter 9, when the abyss is open, who's their leader? A demon called Apollo. 
I think that demon who was, uh, who, who was basically, again, behind this idol, Apollo, is uh, the demon that's released from the, uh, from the abyss. So here, here's, here's the, the story in Acts chapter 16, 16, and 19. This woman is, this woman is following Paul around, speaking. You know, she threw, throws her voice into animals. So it says, now it happened. As he went to, to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. And the girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. Now, that, boy, it sounds like she's promoting the gospel. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. They got arrested. He messed around with their money. By the way, do you know what happened in Judarians when Jesus, when Jesus cast the demons into the pig? You know what the people said? They said, leave us. Don't stick around here. You're going to kill more of our pigs. And you know what's interesting? They were more concerned about the pigs than the man who was sitting at Jesus' feet in his right mind. Right? Money talks. So here again is, is a picture. There are many, many conflicts as you go through the scripture. I want to show you one in the negative. Sons of Sceva. You know the story of the sons of Sceva versus the devil? Or the demon? So the, the sons of, of Sceva are, essentially Sceva is a, is a religious teacher, Jewish teacher. They're not believers. And this is an important lesson for us. So in, in Acts chapter 19, verse 13 through 16, it says, Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took uh, it upon themselves to call on the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by uh, the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who is you? And then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. What does that tell you? You had better make sure you are in Christ and you are empowered if you're going to get involved in a power encounter because you will get your socks knocked off. So let me go to, I want to go to an application here for a few minutes. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 13. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And Jose was teaching. I'm going to share a few things Jose taught us on Friday night because he taught me some things that I was not aware of. The wiles of the devil are his schemes, his strategies. I think that's, that's pretty simple. So he says in verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle. And notice this idea of wrestling. It's, it's a fight. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And here's, here's the, 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 the hierarchy of the enemy principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I'll go on with it in a second. Uh, I want you to notice, you see where it says rulers of darkness? And this is interesting. It's something that Jose shared that I was not aware of. The word there is skotos, and it means essentially these rulers have this purpose of blinding and making ignorant okay, people concerning the things of God. Blinding them concerning uh, morality, blinding them uh, concerning ungodliness. And that's what they're out there doing. Now think about a world. Think about the battles that come against you. And then the word, the word rulers, the word is, is kratio, it, it basically it refers to you know, a power, a ruler, somebody who's, and Satan is the ruler of this world. And then the concept here of um, him trying to take hold and control of people. 
So these principalities, these rulers, these spirituals, trying to, again, blind people and make them ignorant of the things of God. And look at, wait, look at our world. How ignorant are people concerning the things of God? And then trying to take control of their lives. So the, the passage goes on talking about the armor of God. It says, stand therefore, having girded your waist in, with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the pre preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith uh, with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, um, the armor of God, again, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, shoes of peace, right, uh, sword of the Spirit, the word of God. I just understand, what is that? And there's another passage in Scripture in Romans chapter 4, it says, clothe yourself with Jesus. Because Jesus is our salvation, Jesus is our righteousness, Jesus is the truth. Jesus is our peace. And Jesus is our, our faith. And Jesus is the word of God. Clothe yourself with Jesus. Now I want to I wrap this up by, by sharing something with you. I shared it in our Bible study on Thursday night a couple of weeks ago. And it is it, from Jude on preparing for battle. And it's a great passage. I want to share this with you just for a few minutes and then we'll wrap up in prayer. In Jude chapter 20, verse 20, uh, I'm sorry, Jude 20, 21, verse 20, 21. It says, But you, beloved, building yourself up on the most holy faith, praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, praying yourself, yourselves in the love, uh, keep yourself in the loves of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And um, here's, a, here's a great word of exhortation that Jude has given to the church and to us about how we uh, can be prepared for battle. So what, watch this. I wanna, I'll, I'll break this down. First he says, build up. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. And anybody knows this. If you're going into battle, you better be strong. You're going into a physical competition, you better, you better be strong. Anybody who's done a, a combat sport, anybody who's done boxing or wrestling or, or jiu-jitsu or some other martial art, you know this. You have to go in prepared. You have to go in strong. And if we don't go into the battle being strong, we're, we're, again, we're going to get our socks knocked off. And he will discourage us. He will, he will try to depress us. He will try to oppress us. So how do we build ourselves up? Well, I, I would say the word of God, right? Jesus, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I mean, you're, you're feeding your soul, reading the word, meditating on the word, memorizing the word, listening to the word, saturating. Remember what I said? Saturate yourself in the word. Then it incubates. And then you have inspiration. Then you have confirmation. But just, just constantly feeding on the word and I'll tell you, the word, the word is incredibly powerful because the enemy, the enemy, if you are grounded in the word, you're going to be able to withstand the enemy's blows. Now I'll give you something. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 7 and 8, again about building yourself up. It says, but reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. The word here, exercise, it's speaking about train yourself in godliness. He says, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. How many of you work out? Do you just work out aimlessly or do you have a plan? Right? You have a plan, right? I mean, if you're just working out aimlessly, come and see me. I'll, I'll help you. But you need a plan. You need a game plan. You know, I have, I, I have a plan. I, I've had a training plan since I was 13 years old. But I, you know, I train, I, I, I train for strength on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and on Fridays. I do cardiovascular training on Tuesday, on Thursday, and on Saturdays. And I go in the gym and I have a game plan of the exercises that I'm going to do, what I'm going to do on the bike, what I'm going to do on the treadmill, if I'm going out, if I'm running hills, whatever. I, I have a game plan that I work on. How many of you have a spiritual game plan? Or do you just wing it? You just wing prayer, you know, whenever, you know, whenever you can. So the idea of, of, of a spiritual game plan, and I took what I was doing in my physical life and I applied it to my spiritual life when I came to the Lord. And he, each morning I get up, I have a time of reading Scripture, memorizing Scripture, and meditating on Scripture, and studying Scripture. And I usually do about five or six chapters every morning. 
After I'm done reading and meditating on scripture, then I go through my prayer time. And my prayer time is, I use the ACTS program. Adoration, a time of praise, confession, taking a look at myself, confessing my sins to the Lord, thanksgiving, giving thanks to the Lord, and then supplication and intercession where I'm praying and I'm interceding. In the afternoon, I give myself a time of prayer. I'm here tonight. This is, this is part of your training. If you're in a life group during the week, a woman's group, a men's group, that men, that's part of training. Sunday worship is a part of training. This is where we come in to build up our strength so we can go out there and fight the good fight. But if you don't have a training program, good luck. So the, the first one is, is, is build up and build up in the word. Second is pray up. Pray up. I want, to show you, I want to show you something here. It says, pray in the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to pray in the Holy Spirit? And people say, well, what's praying in tongues? That could be a part of it. How many of you have a gift of tongues in the church? I have a gift of tongues. Yeah. So um, I just, I pray at times, and I'll tell you, I don't know what I'm saying, but my spirit is edified by doing it. And it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you're wondering about that. I don't believe that you have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I think tongues is a gift amongst gifts. So Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12, do all speak in tongues, right? Do all have the gift of knowledge? No, right? But uh, I think praying in the Spirit essentially is being led by the Spirit. So again, I, I, I refer you to that verse of Ephesians chapter 5.18. Do not be filled with wine, right? Leads to sin, but be filled with the Spirit. So if you're filled with wine, you're under the influence of wine. If you're filled with the Spirit, you're being led by the Spirit. So being pray in prayer when you're being led by the Spirit is where you're not just coming in with your shopping list and saying, oh God, okay, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want that's, that's not That's not it. It's being led, but just being sensitive. And I, I have to sit, I have to be, be still in a place of solitude with God and let the Spirit begin to lay on my heart what he would have me to intercede for. I've been interceding all day for little Isaiah. I've been praying for him all day. There's other people I'm praying for. I had a friend of mine last week named Nate out in Michigan. He, uh, he almost died. He had a blood clot in his stomach. Wife called me up and said basically he was in ICU. They were doing surgery on him and he was basically at death's door and we, I prayed and I prayed but the Holy Spirit just put him on my heart all day. And just to be led by the Spirit in prayer Lord, what would you have me to pray for? What do you want me to be interested in? So you really start to get in harmony with the Spirit. Your prayers become very effective when you're doing that. In Matthew chapter 17, 20 through 21, again, looking here at conflict, it says, so Jesus said to them, right, they were trying to cast out a demon, they couldn't cast it out. Jesus, John, James, and Peter went up on the Mount Transfiguration. They're up there when they came down. The apostle said, hey, there's this kid that is filled with a demon and we couldn't get him out. Jesus rebukes the demon and the demon flees. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by... Yeah, notice here the combination, prayer and fasting. What's fasting? I want to give you something here. Moses fasted for 40 days. 40 nights. Jesus fasted for 40 days, 40 nights. You see fasting through the scripture. I just want to, I want you to, most people think of fasting as just giving up food. That could be part of it. Even going without water for a time. Not a long time. Uh, but fasting is setting aside not only of food, but of any earthly pleasure in order to seek God and his power in prayer. You know, you know what fasting can be for some of you? Put down your, your devices. Put down your iPhones. Put down your computers. I do a lot of things on the computer for the church. And there's a time, I just put it down. Get away. I don't want to be on the computer when I have my devotions with God. I have the Word of God in front of me. My Bible. But it's, it's setting a time. It could be setting a time, time from food, television, entertainments. And what you're doing is you're devoting yourself to God so He can give you power. He can give you power. And we have a number of people in the church who fast, you know, at different times during the, uh, you know, the week. 
But you just, the purpose of, and again, you can fast and not get the power because the idea is you have to fast to devote yourself to God. Next one is love up. Keep yourself in the love of God. You keep yourself in that. You keep yourself. Abide in the love of God. Abide in Jesus. Romans chapter 8, 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do we believe that? Nothing. Right? What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. Nothing. Living and accepting that by, by faith. So stop and just ask yourself this question. What is the one thing that breaks your fellowship with God? In your personal life, what is the thing that breaks your fellowship with God? Your sin, right? And some people will let their sin break their fellowship with God for long periods of time. All of a sudden, where did so-and-so go? I'll tell you, usually it's usually that they're struggling with some kind of sin and they feel ashamed coming here. And they've started to neglect the Word of God. They've started to neglect prayer. They've you know, started to neglect um, you know, their, their time alone with God. What do you do when you sin? What should you do? Yes. Yeah. So this is the key to, you know, to having unbroken fellowship with God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to come and be honest with God. And if you have a sin that you're habitually struggling with, come and be honest with him. You'll be amazed. And when Jesus, Jesus said, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? And he said, seven times 70. In other words, it's, it, that, that is the, how we are to be forgiven. Now, how great is God's forgiveness for us? So you have, one of those, you have one of those fish hooks in your soul. You know what I'm talking about, the fish hook? Again, it goes real easy. It's really hard to get out. And you're struggling with some sin. It may be something with your mouth. It may be something with your eyes. It may be something with your mind. You need to come and spend time with him. And you need to confess your sins to him. And you need to ask him to help you. And it may take some time to work through this stuff and get that fish hook out. Because sometimes the enemy gets that fish hook in you and it gets in really deep. Uh, last one here is look up. So it says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude. And what are we supposed to be looking up at? We're supposed to be looking and fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What do I say on Sunday? Frame your mind around Jesus. Frame your mind around his word, his will, right? He's the way. Frame your mind around him. You fix your eyes on him. Now, now you're, you're, you've got, your, you got your, your mind, again, fixed on him. Right? You're looking up. You've got your eyes fixed on him. You're, you're praying in the spirit. You're building yourself up in the word of God. You're living in the love of God. Guess what happens? You're prepared now for the, for the battle. And you're not in that place. You get caught off guard. And you know what, you know what happens? Let me just tell you what happens. You may get... Your sock's knocked off. Or you may just pass by an opportunity and not even be aware that God was about to use you to set someone free and you went right by it, but because you're totally unfocused, you're not in a place where you're built up. You're not in a place where you're in prayer. You just walk right past it and you just miss that divine appointment that God wanted to use you. And he wanted to use you to create freedom. Think about it. And I know I've done that before, right? I think we all have been walking, I've done that before. I've been so caught up in my little life that I'm missing the divine appointments that God has for me. So we live in a battle zone. Pray up, build up, love up, look up, and be prepared for the encounters because they will come your way. Let's all bow our heads, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your word. And I pray tonight, Lord God, that, Lord God, we would be used by you to set the captives free. Let us pray prayers, Lord God, to break the chains of, of people who are in the bondage of Satan. Let us pray prayers, Lord God, that would lift the blindness that is blinding people from seeing the truth, people in our lives, people we work with, people in our homes, people in our families, people we love, people we live next to. Father God, use us tonight to pray uh, powerful prayers in the Spirit 
And that, Lord God, you would use us to set the captives free, to free people from the oppression, to free people from spiritual blindness. We be partners with you, Lord Jesus, the Messiah, our Christ. For, Lord God, you have called us to be your little Christ. And in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen.